Well, nothing like starting off with a bang. The first letter is to Ephesus, which makes sense from a geographical perspective since it's the closest city for the messenger coming from the island of Patmos. From a practical perspective, it makes sense since this is where the Apostle John was pastoring before being exiled. And from an importance perspective, it also makes sense. Since the establishment of the Roman province of Asia in 129 BC, Ephesus had always been an important administrative center. But sometime in the latter part of the first century AD, Ephesus supplanted Pergamum as the most important city in Asia, arguably the empire's wealthiest province. Located on the Aegean coast at the mouth of the Keister River, Ephesus had a perfect location for both sea and land travel, making it a coveted gateway city. No wonder it was named Ephesus, which means desirable. Now, Ephesus had an estimated population of at least 250,000, making it the fourth largest city in the entire Roman Empire, behind Rome, Alexandria, and Syrian Antioch, also called Antioch on the Orontes. It was known for many things, its medical practices in school, its magical incantations and spells, its prolific slave trade industry, its gladiatorial contest, as Ephesus was the first city in Asia to host gladiatorial fights in roughly 70 BC. And it was known for much more. Uh, during time of revelation, the emperor Domitian chose Ephesus to be the world center of worship to himself and a massive temple was built to this man who loved to be addressed as Lord and God. But Ephesus's main claim to fame was that it housed the infamous Artemis temple. And not just any Artemis temple, the most significant temple of the most significant mother goddess cult in the entire ancient world. The temple of Artemis was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world in Ephesus. Its footprint was four times the size of the Parthenon in Athens. Now, countless pilgrims from all over the world visited her sanctuary annually. Aside from the Oracle Temple of Apollo in Delphi, the Temple of Artemis was the richest institution in the world. Now, you may recall from the book of Acts that Paul upset the apple cart of the silversmiths who made statues of Artemis in Ephesus and it caused a massive riot that spilled into the theater where the mob shouted for two straight hours, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Now, it's hard to overemphasize the importance of Ephesus, not only to the Roman Empire, but also to the movement of Jesus Christ. From a biblical perspective, you have more followers of Jesus ministering in Ephesus than any other city outside of Jerusalem. Now, Paul spent three years in Ephesus, by far the longest place he ministered during his missionary journeys. In addition to Paul, you have people ministering in Ephesus of the likes of Aquila and Priscilla, Apollos, Erastus, Gaius, Aristarchus, Luke, Tychicus, Timothy, and of course, the Apostle John. What's more, according to church tradition, even Jesus' mother Mary spent significant time in Ephesus. It's a ridiculously important city. And how Jesus begins these letters with what he says to his followers in Ephesus is just as important. He has some positive things to commend them on, but he also has some really challenging words. And may we all have ears to hear as we dig into the letter to Ephesus. Yeah, good morning, everyone. I hope you're ready for this. As Brad said, what a, a letter to start in, John's letter to Ephesus. So if you have a Bible, please turn to Revelation chapter 2, and we're going to read from verse 1 through verse 7. This is the first letter that Jesus sent to the churches in Asia. Let's read this. Revelation chapter 2, beginning to read at verse one. There we go. Okay. So, to the angel of the church in Ephesus write, 
These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, that you've tested those who claim to be apostles but are not, and have found them false. You have persevered and have endured hardships for my name and not grown weary. Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. But you have this in your favor. You hate the practices of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Whoever is ears to hear, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. To begin with here, I want you to note how many things the Ephesian church does well. This is a church that gets an awful lot right. Now, you note at the end there it says they hate the practices of the Nicolaitans. We don't really know who the Nicolaitans were, what they taught. Some people think this traces its way back to Nicholas, one of the seven, in Acts chapter 6. But quite honestly, we don't know. But the point is there was a strong group who taught false practices. And Jesus commends them, having challenged them, uh, he commends what they did there. That's a lot that they've done right. But as we've already noted last week from Steve and here from Brad, there's always a challenge. And Jesus has a challenge that he gives to this church. And it's a challenge to love. But in order to understand what that love is, I want to back up a little bit and, and point out that when we understand Ephesus, we begin to understand why Jesus commends the church the way he does. In Acts chapter 19 and verse 35, the city of Ephesus is called the guardian of the temple. The guardian of the temple. The word guardian here is the Greek word neokoros. Koros means to sweep. So the city became known as the sweeper of the temple. Josephus, the Jewish historian, used the same word, neokoros, to talk about the Jews' attitude towards their temple in Jerusalem. Neokoros, Acts 19.35, refers to then how the city's population understood their role in the worship of their temple. They were servants of a religious movement that Acts 19.27 tells us spread to the entire world. So basically what kind of the temple in Jerusalem was to the Jews, what the papacy, the Rome was to the Romans, the temple of Artemis was to the city of Ephesus and to the Asian world. Artemis. Artemis was the twin sister of Apollo. She is one of the 12 gods of the Olympia. And her temple was magnificent. Now, as Brad said, at this point in time, there were about 250,000 people who called Ephesus home. This is a, a rendition of what it would have looked like. Magnificent city. Notice the river coming in there. That's the river Keister. If I had time, I would go into this and show how the labor of love that the Ephesians put in and the lampstands moving, it can actually be tied to what happened in that river. That river would silt. And so up until about the third century, the Roman Empire, the emperor would basically pay for that river to be dredged so that ships could continue to come in. When that happened, some of the lampstands were moved. This is the city. It's a magnificent city. And at the heart of it all there, you can basically see the temple of Artemis. 
in 29 BC, the imperial cult or emperor worship was added to the worship of Artemis and a section of the temple of Artemis was devoted to emperor worship. And so you have Augustus, for example, uh, he was of, of Luke II fame, uh, Caesar Augustus, you know, the guy who ordered a decree, there was a statue built for him that was three times his height. And so you had emperor worship. Now, a number of the emperors didn't necessarily believe that they were gods, but they certainly allowed people to pray to the emperor, sacrifice for the emperor, uh, pray for the emperor. But as Brad said, Domitian, by the time we get to the 90s, okay, 90 AD, he was someone who uh, figured himself to be a god, was addressed Lord and God, and he really ramped up the heat. He built the temple. This is the remains of it, but you can see its footprint here. It was an absolutely enormous uh, temple. The bottom line here is that we can't grasp Ephesus until we understand how central to Ephesian life polytheism was, Artemis worship, and the worship of the emperor. This is again a rendition of what it would have been like to stand in front of the Artemis temple. Everything in that city flowed through the temple, absolutely everything. Artemis was considered, for example, the protector of women. She was the protector of the criminally accused. The temple also was the source of welfare for the needy. Now think about that, the welfare for the needy. If you had needs, you went to the temple. Is it any coincidence then that we have the most detailed criterion of benevolence in Paul's letter to Timothy, who's stationed in Ephesus. You see, what would happen is that some of the needy, the widows, would step out of polytheism into Christ, and they would therefore miss out on state-funded support. In response to this, Paul writes the most detailed criterion of benevolence that we get in the entire gospel. I'll say it again. You cannot understand John's letter to Revelation until you deal with the Artemis cult, until you deal with Artemis' temple. Not only was it the source of welfare, it was also the point of uh, social connections. It functioned as a convention center. So when artists would paint new things or, or uh, you know, chisel new sculptures, it would basically be put on show in the temple. It was also the source for uh, new inventions, all paraded at the temple. Everything flowed through the life of the temple. There were 23 different classifications of employees employed at the temple. The temple owned 77,000 acres of prime farmland in the region. It owned sacred pools that basically flowed up the Keister River that was the source for the best fish. Every year in the months overlapping March and April, there would be this festival called the Artemisia where Artemis the god and 29 other gods were paraded through these glorious city streets and led into the grand theater of Acts 19 fame. Everything in this city revolved around the temple. You do not understand Ephesus unless you understand the importance of Artemis and the imperial cult. Life revolved around this goddess, Artemis. I haven't got time to go here either. The key to this message is for me to forget 90% of what I can tell you. Where did Brad say church history says Mary lived? Ephesus. Is it any wonder with the rise of the, uh, of, of the kind of Christian faith becoming an empire faith that we replaced Artemis, Diana as she was called, with Mary? See, when some people come to faith, they replace one thing with another one. But you don't understand life. In Ephesus, you don't understand this latter unless you understand Ephesus. Now, if the latter to Ephesus were a movie, it wouldn't be a fairy tale because there really isn't a happy end. 
It wouldn't be an action movie either because it takes place, the story we're going to uh, trace takes place over 40 years and it involves so many different actors. But there's one theme. There's one constant theme that comes up from the beginning through until the end. And one part of that theme is what Jesus commends the people for. He commends them for their vigilance. And the other part of the theme is basically what he challenges them for. But right at the beginning of this, have a look at what Paul again to Timothy says. Timothy, guard what has been entrusted to your care. Turn away from godless chatter and the opposing of ideas of what is falsely called knowledge. So Paul leaves Timothy in Ephesus, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 3 through 5. As I urged you when I went into Macedonia, stay there in Ephesus so that you may command certain people not to teach false doctrines any longer or to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies. Such things promote promote controversial speculations rather than advancing God's work, which is by faith. You see over and over again, we trace this drama in Ephesus over four decades. From its beginning in Acts chapter 18 with who? Apollos, a guy who what? Didn't have the message down properly, so that Aquila and Priscilla had to correct him. We go into Acts chapter 19, right at the start of Acts 19. Paul encounters his first meeting in Ephesus. He encounters some elders who don't have the message down properly, and he corrects them. Over and over and over again, in Ephesus, there is this idea of wrong teaching that the church needs to stand against. You see, the battle in Ephesus is between a religion, Artemis, okay, and the imperial cult that brings everything into itself, accepts everything into itself, and the Christian faith that rejects everything but its own God and Lord Jesus Christ. C.S. Lewis once said, the battle of the religions will be between Hinduism that accepts everything and Christianity that rejects everything but itself. Life in Ephesus worked really, really well as long as people played along. But then enter the Christian. Then enter the Christian and everything changed. But what we see, right, this constant theme through four decades is vigilance, vigilance, vigilance. Ephesus is associated with so much false teaching that the church had to be on their guard to stand against. You don't understand Jesus' commendation to the church in Ephesus unless you understand Ephesus. When you understand Ephesus, you can understand how significant it was that over and over again, leaders stand up against false teaching. But there was a problem. And you see it right here. The goal of this command is what? Love. Love. And so when we jump into the challenge in Revelation chapter 4, this is what we see. I hold this against you. If you have forsaken the love you had at first, or is it your first love? Depending on your translation here, that last part is going to read one of two ways. It will either read, you have forsaken your first love. In other words, the commentators are, are assuming that this love that they were missing is actually, they have forgotten their love for Jesus. Or other translations will say, the love you have at first. No, the problem is, you're standing up for the truth, but you're forgetting the importance of doing everything in love. The question is, which is it? All but two translations that I jumped into kind of hedged their bets a little bit. Oops, a pastor talked about betting, but forget that for a second. They, they kind of say, you've forgotten your first love or the love you have at first. And you can kind of go either way on this one. But the Passion Translation and the Good News Bible, before you email me, yes, some of you won't think that's a translation, more of a paraphrase. But they actually are the modern translations that jump in and say, you have abandoned or forsaken the love you have for me. For me, they jump headlong into the, this. Is, this is basically about a love for Jesus. Now, those two translations have to deal with something in the text. In the early part of the text, Jesus says, you have, you've done all of this and I commend you for it. And you've done it for my name. You've done it for me. I don't know about you folks, but having gone through all that these people went through, I've got a feeling that that is an indication of love, isn't it? So for those two translations, they need to do something with the word for here. 
Why else would you experience so much hardship unless you loved someone? So what they do is they translate this word for as because, because of me. So in other words, they were kind of tacked on to that Christian community. They got embroiled in it, and that's why it happened. So there is this debate about, okay, what is the challenge here? The, the accommodation is clear. They were vigilant. But the challenge of love, is it a love for Jesus or is it a love for other people? I want to suggest to you that some debates are, are really not even necessary. Some arguments are not necessary. Heard about a Missouri farmer who died and he left 17 mules for his three th sons. His older son was to receive a half, his second son was to receive a third, and his younger son was to receive a ninth. The sons argued because they realized you couldn't get a half, a third, and a ninth from 17. So they argued. The uncle in the neighboring town realized what was going on, hitched up his mule, drove over to the kids, put his mule with the 17 to make 18, a half of 18 is 9, a third of 18 is 6, ninth of 18 is 2, 9 plus 6 plus 2 equals 17. He hitched up his mule and he rode all the way home. Some arguments are completely unnecessary. This whole idea of it, is it about Jesus or is it about other people? It's unnecessary. Maybe John is being ambiguous. Maybe Jesus is being ambiguous for a reason. You know why? We cannot properly love other people unless we love Jesus. And if our love for Jesus doesn't result in a love for other people, then we are prioritizing orthodoxy over orthopraxy, and that isn't biblical either. John himself says, if you claim to love God and you do not love other people, you are a liar, okay? And he's writing here to churches in Asia, you're a liar and the Spirit of God doesn't live in you. What is going on here when you trace this all the way back from the beginning is a common theme. This was a really difficult city in which, a global city, in which everything could be accepted as long as nothing was excluded. And then you have the Christians entering in here and preaching an exclusive message about Jesus, and it basically caused a scene. Right from the beginning, it caused a scene. From the moment that Peter, uh, from the moment that Paul walked in. Here's the reality. It misrepresents our faith when we present ourselves and the truth in an unloving way. And I think this is what Jesus is trying to get to. Listen, folks. We can sometimes be so passionate about the truth that we forget the love of, the, the love of God that revealed it to us as sinners while we were far away. And we forget, can forget how important it is to represent that love the same way. Listen, as America goes more secular, this is going to be more and more important for us to hold on to. Some of the foundations, Christian foundations of this nation may well be evaporating away, may well be drifting away. And the challenge on the church, therefore, to stand up for the truth and what is right is going to be more important than ever. But listen, Jesus is saying to us right now, we cannot do that in a way that forgets love. And so from the beginning here, with Timothy all the way through, we can basically see how important this theme of truth and love was. And if you think about it, Christians entered into Ephesus, Acts 18, it's all internal, then Acts 19, Paul does what he does. He basically goes into the synagogue and he starts talking to the Jews. And he's there for three months talking to the Jews. And as he's talking to them, they get really agitated by him. And then from there, he uh, basically goes into a lecture hall, the hall of Tyrannus. He, he rents that. He's there for three years. And the ministry keeps growing and keeps growing and keeps growing. And this exclusive city is now encountering an exclusive faith. And it gets to the point where people are actually getting rid of all of these books and everything else. 50,000 drachmas, by the way, is an awful lot of money. They're getting rid of money. They're getting, uh, their trade is going down. And so what we have in Acts 19 is this riot where Demetrius, one of the silversmiths, very interesting there, he is set to call other groups with him. Ephesus was sectarian. It had a very strong union to it, called all of these other unions to it in order to confront Paul. Why? Because this exclusive faith of Jesus was now confronting an inclusive polytheistic religion. And you have to understand that religion was the glue of the city. How the Romans kept that empire together was two things. Firstly, a common language, Greek, just like we have English today. Secondly, it was a common religion. And that religion 
pulled everything into itself, into the Christians who basically preached a message that excluded everything but itself. And then haven't got time to go into this, but what's interesting is if you have a look at Revelation chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, and then Revelation chapter 2, verse 7, we see Jesus being presented at the beginning of this letter and at the end of this letter in a way that challenges emperor worship and Artemis directly. In verses 1 and 2, the lampstands, the stars, Jesus is presented as the new Caesar, someone who commands the right to life. Someone who is the real God. There is no God but Jesus. There is no Caesar but Jesus. That is what would be understood by the, those ancient believers. Romans 2 verse, uh, Revelation 2 verse 7 here talks about the tree of life. Those who are victorious will eat of the tree of life. Did you know that there are two trees in the Garden of Eden? The first tree is the, the tree of what? knowledge of good and evil. The second one, Genesis chapter 3, verse 22, is the tree of life. That tree of life is the source of eternal life. Well, guess what? Artemis was said to have, she is the twin sister of Apollo, okay? She was said to have been Apollo born under a palm tree. The main open-air shrine in that temple in Ephesus stood under an oak tree, which was referred to as the tree of life. Right in the heart of this letter, it encourages these believers, listen, I know how hard it is for you to stand up for truth in a, in a city that embraces everything but you. Funny how people can be tolerant of everything apart from those who are intolerant of them. We get the same thing today. I know how hard it is, but listen to me. I am the one who has the right to rule, not Caesar. I am the one who gives you not just everlasting life. Look at Proverbs in the tree of life. I give you life while you live right now. Do not abandon me just because the heat has been turned up. So what we have in this letter, both from the biblical text that I'll show you and also from uh, the context of revelation itself and archaeology and history it is a pretty clear message. Listen, it is not easy standing up for the truth in a polytheistic kind of inclusive society. But listen, my message must be held onto. So what I want to do here is I want to present this, this letter to Ephesus within the context of the continuing story of God's work in Ephesus right from the beginning all the way through. And, and what we will see is nearly everything here can be put through this filter of truth and love. Truth and love. What we discover is that when Paul told Timothy to stay in Ephesus, he said, God, that word God okay, really uses a word or embraces an idea the commentators say sums up Jesus' commendation to the church in Revelation. It's the word vigilance. They were vigilant. Has the idea of guarding it. Timothy, guard the truth. Watch out. Over and over again, we see this word coming up. It's the idea of vigilance. So in a two-by-two, two, some of you use them for business. This is a two-by-two. Two. And what you'll do is you'll put two ideas there because these ideas allow you to tap into a bigger picture with more information. So what I'm going to be able to do with this is for the next 20 minutes or so, I'm going to take you through Ephesus from beginning to end. And by doing that, we are going to be able to understand clearly what Jesus meant when he said, listen, I want you to protect the truth, but I do not want you to forget love. And if you forget love, you need to repent. You need to turn around. You need to walk the other direction because truth cannot be presented in a way that forgets love. And at the end of this, what I want to do is I want to ask that question, so how did they do? The great thing about Ephesus is it's Ephesus and people didn't stop going through there. And so we have letters, we have writings from the church in Ephesus that again ties back to this theme. So that vertical is vigilance. They need to be vigilant. They need to protect the truth. But at the same time, that horizontal axis, they need to present love. So let's ask this question. When someone is vigilant without being loving, what kind of quality are they manifesting? When I thought about that, I put down this word, suspicion. If we're being vigilant without love, we're not just being weary or cautious, 
If this is what we do over and over and over again, we are actually living suspiciously. The bottom line is relationships are built on trust. When you have vigilance without love, you have suspicion. Now let's make this clear as well. To be cautious is not wrong. To be weary is not wrong. But to be cautious all the time is the problem because a skeptical mind will see the proof it needs wherever it looks. This is the problem. Now remember, the city of Ephesus is highly mobile. It's highly polytheistic. People coming in and people coming out. And so believers needed to be vigilant. There's not a problem with being vigilant. But here's the point. If all they ever did was play detective, relationships would break. Let me tell you this, if you have been hurt professionally or personally, and that has led you to the point where you are now suspicious about everyone, you are playing detective in your relationship, and your relationships are more broken than you think. How understandable is this for a church that is being marginalized by the Jews, I'll show you in a second, as well as by the Gentiles. They're going through so much persecution and opposition, especially if the letter is written in Domitian's reign, but if it was in Nero's reign, which is about the 70s, it would equally be true. How much more true is it of a, of a Christian community that is being marginalized and oppressed from both sides? And yet over and over again, we read these terms, be hospitable, open the doors, welcome people into your home. How easy is that going to be? It is so easy for them to be suspicious. And so by suspicious here, we're talking about constant vigilance to the point where a commitment to the truth prevents real relationships from forming and deepening. And again, if you're here and you've ever been betrayed, you know what I'm talking about. You know what I'm talking about here. How do you learn to trust when you've been hurt? One of the notable factors of Christian ministry in Asia is that to- uh, the constant opposition that they faced. We see this in Acts 19. I've already referenced it here, but there's the verse Acts 19.9. When Paul was ministering to the Jews, some of them became obstinate. They refused to believe, publicly maligned away. So Paul left them. He took the disciples with him and had discussions daily in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. Why would he go there? Well, the Western texts tell us that he did this between, I think it's 11 and 4 or 1 and 4. Why would he do that? Well, that information is really important. He would go to the hall for three reasons. Firstly, and this is important, the Christian community is growing. It offered more space. More space. Secondly, he would do it because of the time of day. More people were awake in Ephesus at 1 a.m. in the morning than they were at 1 p.m. They would do something called the Asian siesta. Which basically meant what? More people would actually be able to come at that time in the day because they would not have no other responsibility. We get the picture here of a growing community of people, and this is what alienated those silversmiths. Because all of a sudden, they're losing traction. All of a sudden, this Christian community is undermining the entire way of life. And as a result of that, the silversmiths riot. And Paul is nearly lynched, apart from the fact that a group called Asiarchs, I think it's in verse 31, if you want to look at that, actually come to Paul's aid and try to encourage legal ways to deal with this. Why? Because this was an empire that basically allowed everything to exist, providing you didn't undermine the very nature of the religion uh, that drove the city. So what we see here is opposition. In the face of opposition, suspicion is normal. Now what's also interesting is when you look at this, the vigilance of believers in Acts led to Paul leaving, forcefully leaving, told you need to get out of here or they're going to kill you, all of these places, Thessalonica, Berea, Iconium, Damascus, Jerusalem. So what's my point here? Being vigilant is not wrong. Only being vigilant is wrong. I remember I came home from seminary at the end of my first year, and we were doing some special meetings one week, invited some guests in, and did a, like a, an altar call one Sunday night, and a number of people came to faith, including some of the people I'd invited from our street in Wales. And, 
And, and I, the church wasn't big, so if I'm kind of standing here, the, the entire church is probably just like this front section here. And, and I looked, and there at the back left was two guys sitting there that I'd never seen before, and they had black pants on and a white shirt. Any of you know kind of people, religious people that wear black and white? I'd never seen a Latter-day Saint before, especially not in Wales. I mean, I traveled around and I taught about them, but I looked, and, and what was funny, one of the guys who came to faith in Christ left, and I saw these guys look at one another, get up, and follow him out. So I walked out of the church, and I watched as these guys followed him home. Through the week, I made some connections, and I discovered that these two Latter-day Saints had jumped on this guy who'd made a commitment for Christ, and they were trying to disciple him in the Latter-day Saint way, and this guy didn't know any different. So I made sure that my friend came back to church next week, believing and hoping that the Mormons, shouldn't say that today, right, Latter-day Saints would actually come too. And true enough, they stood, right, they sat right at the back there. And I'm like, okay, I know what I'm doing here. I walked up to him, and I said, hey guys, I I'm Craig, what's yours? He told me the names, I remember one guy, Dietmar, he was a German. And I said, uh, so what are you doing? And they tried to be all kind of... Uh, airy fairy about what they were doing. And I said, look, let's just cut to the chase here. You're Latter-day Saints. And they looked at me and I said, more than that, I saw last week as you and I changed what I saw. And I said, hey, I called to the church and especially young adults. I said, young adults, come over here. And they're about 25 or 30, right around in a circle. And I just pointed out to those 25 and 30, the key differences between their gospel and ours. And I said, guys, you make up your mind, but I want to tell you, Jesus said, if, even if an angel of light preaches another gospel, other than the gospel of, that has been preached, let them be cursed. Dietmar lasted about a month before he was sent home to Germany. He could not do it. I want to tell you, vigilance is important. And sometimes vigilance needs to be firm. We have to go around with our eyes open. The problem that is being dealt with here is it's a lot easier to do this when we've never been hurt. When we've been hurt, when we've been betrayed, it's so easy, basically, to live suspicious. And as soon as we're suspicious, our vigilance puts our relationships on a course to, ultimate, to an ultimate end. They will never work in the way that they should. Look at this text too. Is this surprising? Acts 20, Paul goes to Miletus, 68 miles south. Why doesn't he go into the harbor of Ephesus? Two reasons. One, it was possibly being dredged. Secondly, he couldn't because of the, of the, of the kind of hit on his life. Take your pick. But look at what he says to these leaders in the church in Ephesus. Keep watch, be shepherds. Keep watch, do it in love. Keep watch, be shepherds. Over and over again, right from the beginning, we see this, and I want to suggest to you that what we see in the beginning, we see at the end, and we can trace it all the way through. Listen, when you stand up for the truth, God says to you, do not be suspicious. Be vigilant. But vigilance on its own is never a scriptural thing. Remember what we said a couple of weeks ago, vigilance without thanksgiving leads to hopelessness. Vigilance without Sobriety leads to anxiety. Vigilance without love leads to suspicion. And that is not the way that God calls us to live. Next part of this, vigilance and love. What is love without vigilance? It's basically dilution. Some of you may well be listening to this thinking, you know what, I'm too suspicious. I need to put more love into my relationships. But there's a problem, right? Whenever there's a corrective that comes, you can often go too far. So a modern example of that, prosperity theology, right? The, the, the kind of approach to people in ministry years ago was, you know, God, you bless them, we'll keep them poor. And so what you had was people going back into the scriptures basically saying, wait, financial blessing isn't a bad thing, but what did you have? You had it going way too far. The whole idea of prosperity theology is just a different gospel that God has to, is bound by law to bless us. There's a reaction that goes way too far. This is what can happen in a message like this. You can hear me saying, listen, you need to put the love back in your defense of the truth. But then what can happen is you become so loving that you never stand up for the truth. And then the truth just gets watered down. We just need to include everybody. We just need to embrace everything. And so what we see in the scriptures here, especially from John in 2nd and 3rd John, why is this important? 
These are written about 85 AD, about five years before John would have penned Revelation. He's either in Patmos when he writes them or in Ephesus. He's writing letters here to believers, probably around Ephesus, but certainly in Asia. He's writing, and look at what he says here. And he is writing, by the way, to a woman. I wish I could go into this again. Artemis, a woman, Mary, a woman. Paul says, I do not permit a woman to speak. Where is he in Ephesus? Why would he say that in Ephesus when in Corinth he said that a woman could? Folks, a lot of debate is unnecessary. Look at the history and we'll find out what's going on. There's a context for this. This is to a lady who had a church meet in her house. Okay, look at what he says. I say this to you because many deceivers who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ are coming in the flesh have gone out into the world. So watch out that you do not lose what we have worked for but that you may be rewarded fully. Anyone who runs ahead and does not continue in the teaching of Christ does not have God. Whoever continues in the teaching is both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not take them into your house or welcome them. Anyone who welcomes them shares in their wicked work. John is warning this lady to be careful that her love recognized and exemplified through his hospitality, welcoming people in, doesn't result in the truth that she held on to at first, being watered down. And this is a message, believe me, that I could show verse after verse after verse after verse. The very next letter is basically 3 John 9 and 10. This is what we read there. Same thing, 80, 85, probably written around the same time. This is written to a believer in a church who is a, a really good guy, but it's also, it's written about a, a leader of the church who wasn't. Look at what happened here. I wrote to the church, but Diotrophes, who loves to be first, will not welcome us. So when I come, I will call attention to what he is doing, spreading malicious nonsense about us. Not satisfied with that, he even refuses to welcome other believers, and he also stops those who want to do so and puts them out of the church. The point here is this is a church that was so loving, it allowed a false teacher to come in, and that false teacher redirected the church so that even John himself was maligned. John is saying, listen, folks, when I talk to you about love, I'm not asking you to abandon the truth. I'm just saying that if your, your relationships are only ever built on love, that there isn't the clarity of what is true and right and honorable, your relationships really are built on something other than the love that comes from God. So you see, if vigilance without love leads to suspicion, which never allows relationships to form or people to change, love without vigilance leads to a dilution to the truth, and it's through the truth that people are changed. So you can imagine, right? This is the, this is the context that these believers are living in. This isn't easy. Like when Steve said last week, probably while some people, look, let me take you to some places where it really is persecution. Somebody sent me a video this week saying the American church is persecuted. No, come with me to Asia, please. Come with me to Cambodia. Come with me to Jakarta, where Pastor Sandy has been run out of his church seven times. And then you'll know what it's like. Can you imagine how difficult it is to be in an environment like that, trying to be faithful? And then Jesus comes along and he says, okay, you're doing a really good job with this, but... Some, he would say, I need you to be more loving. To others, he would say, I need you to be more truth-centered. Can you not perceive with me how easy it is for some people to just say, I can't do this. I'm just going to back off. Do you know how hard it is to live between that, those lines of truth and love? It's really amazing. Some of the most difficult times in ministry for me emotionally have been when I have needed to confront truth in leaders, in love, and the people that should have stood with me, and I'm not talking about here, <laughs> the people who should have stood with me backed off because they wanted to keep themselves safe. How many of you have done that? How many of you have basically said, you know, I know this issue needs to be dealt with, and I know God wants me to do it and wants us to do it, but you're on your own on this one, I ain't. You know, Paul felt like that when it came to Asia. And this is basically what this means, right? You pull back from the path to do nothing to jeopardize your safety. Paul knew what this was like in Asia. 
you know that everyone in the province of Asia has deserted me, including Hugulus and Hermogenes. Why did they desert him? We don't know, but we do know what was going on as Christianity grew. It, it kind of upset the apple cart with polytheistic religion, but it also upset the apple cart with the Jews. And, and here's why. Firstly, obviously, the Christian church initially was inside of Judaism, but as time went on, they realized that the two, the two uh, truths were not compatible. And so the Jews stood up against uh, those Jewish believers, Christians, uh, simply for their faith in the Lord Jesus. But there was a second reason. The second reason was political. You see, for a long time, Jews had got an exception from Rome that allowed them to collect their gold and take it to Jerusalem. Folks, the collections of Paul taking to the Christians in Jerusalem, you see what's going on here? Everything makes sense when you understand Ephesus. So you've got this, this permission that was emperor sanctioned for the Jews to basically make offerings to their temple in Jerusalem but make no contribution at all to the temple of Artemis to the temple of Domitian to all of these other temples and so much gold was going to Jerusalem that in AD 49 and AD 51 started in Alexandria went to Sardis and there were riots basically where Gentiles were saying hey listen to me this isn't right this isn't right the Jews have to contribute here but the Jews are like we can't do that we can't contribute to a pagan temple and the emperor over and over again came out and said no this is fine they can take their money and they can take it to Jerusalem here's the problem Acts 15 happened what do we do with Gentiles who convert to Christ? Do they need to be circumcised or not? Circumcision was the point of differentiation between Jews and Gentiles. All of a sudden, there are more Gentiles coming into the Jewish faith. There is watering down the distinction, and the Jews are basically not liking this because now the, the political benefits that they get are going to walk away. And so you have this increasing polarization, pulling away from those Jewish believers by Jews simply on the basis of privilege from Rome. And the Christians are more and more isolated. And as all of this tension builds up, we know that more and more people like the Asiarchs, Acts, uh, Acts 19.31, other people who would have been more supportive of Christians, backed off. Again, I want to say, I want to say it. it's not easy to live in the line between truth and love. You take so many risks when that's where you live that the temptation is real for us to back off and say, you know what, I ain't going to get involved in this. I'm going to play it safe. This isn't always the right response. And God says, look, don't do that. So what is God calling us to? I think he's calling us to what I'm calling a sacred trust. Sacred trust. That's basically the ability to balance a passion for truth with a compassion for people. Even if those people have hurt you, even if life has battered you, God says, look, I know. It's easy for you to fall back. I know. But I want you to step in. Now, early in that quadrant here, I cited Second John, where accepting people shouldn't come at the expense of watering down the truth. Well, this is what follows this. Look at this. And now, dear lady, the lady that he's writing to, some people try and say this is the church. I don't believe it is. I think it's a woman he's writing to. And now, dear lady, I'm not writing to you a new command, but one we have heard from the beginning. I ask that we love one another, and this is love that we walk in obedience to his commands. As you've heard from the beginning, his command is that you walk in love. Notice this, the command to vigilance that John has just talked about is grounded in the command to love. Now, how does this look like in practice, Third John? Having rebuked the leader of the church for not getting it right, John commends a member of the church for getting it right. Dear friend, you are faithful in what you are doing to the brothers and sisters, even though they're strangers to you. They have told the truth about your love. Please send them on their way in a manner that honors God. It was for the sake of the name. Notice the name for the name, Revelation 2, 3. It was for the sake of the name that they went out, receiving no help from the pagans. 
We ought therefore to show hospitality to such people so that we may work together for the truth. He was a guy who basically vigilantly loved. He discerned what was right and true and honorable and he put love into practice in a way that marked him out for special commendation from the Apostle John. I heard one time of a seminary professor having to teach on Sir John and that seminary professor said, I don't know why this is in the Bible, it has no use whatsoever. I thought, you clearly don't know the history of the text. This is supremely important for what local churches are supposed to do with missionaries, if not anything else. But again, let me bring all of this home. This is what this looks like for all of us, right? We're called to practice the truth in love. Truth only, we're going to be suspicious, we're going to be hard, we're going to be harsh. Our relationships will suffer. Love only, we're going to water down the truth, we're going to dilute things, and the ministry of Christ in our own life suffers. If it gets too hard for us, we're going to back off, and we're just going to play, play it safe through all of life. That's the wrong response. God calls us to a sacred trust, but this is where it comes from. Again, how many of you have been betrayed, professionally or personally, and you have ever found yourself saying, God, I will never love like that again. It's a natural response. It's a natural response. So what's the solution to that? Psychologists tell us that the solution to this is actually not to think about trust. You see, you can't think about trust, they'll tell you, for as long as you're holding on to the hurt. What the Bible tells us we need to do is not think about what we should do. What the Bible tells us to do is to run to Jesus and ask him to help us do what we cannot do. And that's why the idea, and I believe this refers to the way that they were loving other people, how they were interacting with other people. But what John is making it abundantly clear is, listen, people, you cannot do this unless your love for Jesus grows. We have to press into Jesus. God has prepared a place for you and me, and it's right in his heart. It's right in his heart. Counselors will call this, often with people working through betrayal in a marriage relationship, they'll call it a wise trust. See, vigilance is important. For at the end of the day, if we live our lives constantly suspicious, it just destroys relationships. And the more we've been hurt, the easier it is to do. And Jesus is saying to this church, you have done so much. But hey, I need you to love. And this is so important to me that I actually need you to, to repent. So here's the question. How'd they do? How'd they do? One of the great things about Ephesus is it's Ephesus. People kept going to Ephesus. So if you take the latter date for John, which is where we land, written around the 1890s, in 105 AD, 15 years later, there's a guy called Ignatius, Bishop Ignatius. And Bishop Ignatius goes through, excuse me, goes through Ephesus. And as he goes through Ephesus, he is so blown away by what's going on. Now, Ignatius is going through Ephesus on his way to die. The persecution is real. He is basically on his way to his death. And he stops in Ephesus, believers uh, minister to him, and he writes a letter to a guy called Onesimus. Heard that name before? Onesimus is probably, we think, the guy that Paul met in a Roman jail cell. This is the guy who was owned by somebody in Colossae. Probably the church met in his house. Know the letter to Philemon? Paul encounters Onesimus in Rome, leads Onesimus to Christ and said, the mark, the fruit of your repentance will be that you will go back to Philemon and face your punishment. Could have been death. Onesimus goes back and Paul has that letter, Philemon, with him. And Paul begs Philemon not to punish him, but to bless him and to include him. Historians say that it is likely the bishop, the leader in Ephesus, is now this former convert. Ignatius writes this letter to Onesimus about the church. This is what he said. It's a brilliant letter, but this is, this is basically what he said. Therefore... So this is chapter 4 of it. Therefore, in your concord and harmonious love, Jesus Christ is so. 
and man by man become acquired, that being harmonious in love and taking up the song of God in unison, you may with one voice sing to the Father through Jesus Christ so that he may both hear you and perceive by your works that you are indeed members of his Son. That's how they did. Jesus says, repent or I'll move your lampstand. That, that city of Ephesus moved over and over again as the river silted up. But that church, that church radiated the light of Christ for as long as it was there. Fifteen years later, how did they do? I haven't had time to go into this. AD 155, a guy called Justin Martyr. If you read church history, Justin Martyr is amazing. Under Justin Martyr's leadership, the church exploded to about 20 million, we think. 155, he goes through Ephesus. And in Ephesus, he meets the church and he has a conversation, a debate with a Jew by the name of Trypho. And we've got the, the record of the conversation and right there, and remember, this is an opponent. Right there at the end of this letter, Trypho basically says, Onesimus, it is so sad that we cannot stay and enjoy more fellowship. It is such a disappointment to me because what we have here is so much common ground that I wouldn't have thought it. And he basically thanks Justin Martha for the way that he'd received him. There's this beautiful picture here of the change that had taken place, not inter just internally between the saints and their love, but also externally between those that opposed the Christian church. It's just a beautiful picture. And church, I think this is what God is calling us to. For some of us who have been betrayed personally, professionally, God is saying, listen, I know it's hard, but live in that quadrant. Live with the sacred trust. Press into me and allow me to heal your hurt and your pain. And then you will learn to love again. Secondly, I think he's saying it to us as his church. In a world that is becoming so inclusive that exclusive truth of Jesus Christ is becoming abhorrent to many. In a sense, history isn't moving forward, history is moving backwards. And when we look at this letter, we see Jesus challenging us, listen, stand firm in the faith. But as you debate, as you dialogue, as you live, as you resist, let's do it in love. Let's go to God in prayer, shall we? Let's pray together. Father, I want to thank you for the love that you have poured into our hearts that we've received by faith. Scripture says over and over again, this is love, not that we loved you, but that you loved us and Christ died for us. Father, I just pray that through this week, your love would overwhelm us. For those of us who are feeling the pain of hurt and betrayal, maybe recent, maybe years ago, and just listening to these words, it just comes up again. God, I pray that your love would set them free. Father, I pray that through knowing you, their hurts would be healed, and their love and their trust would grow. Let their relationships moving forward be far deeper and far more significant than they've ever been to this point. And for us as your church, I pray that you would Help us to be as vigilant with the truth as the Ephesian church was. But Father, may we do it in love. In a season of so much animosity and hatred and dissension and division, may we, Father, love one another with the love that you have given to us. But may we also love those who oppose us, who stand against us. And Father, may they respond to us as trifled to Justin Martyr in commending the way that we live. Father, we love you and we thank you in Jesus' name.